The water pump is an impeller driven by the serpentine belt that circulates coolant throughout the engine. As it rotates, it sucks coolant in from the lower radiator hose and the heater core, where it then pushes it through the engine block, and by the physics of pressure, it makes its way through the cylinder head up to the thermostat, where it then endlessly cycles and keeps your engine from overheating. A water pump is not intended to last forever. These are normal maintenance things that eventually give up, usually by bearing failure. This will typically make a noticeable grinding noise, the pulley might wobble as it spins, and it can leak from the weep hole, which is intentionally manufactured in all water pumps to warn you of its impending doom. When coolant comes out of the weep hole, it means the seals on the inside of the pump are about to fail and blow out. And the seals usually only fail when the bearing does. Sometimes the leaking coolant can get onto the belt and cause it to squeal, which might sound like this. So, if you have any of these symptoms, replacing the water pump should be your very next priority. The 4 liter in the Cherokee specifically is known for having cooling system issues because of a big ass engine and a relatively small space. At that, some say you have to remove the radiator to replace the water pump, which is not true as I'll demonstrate in this video. However, if you have no records of your Jeep and have no idea when the last time any cooling system components were replaced, you may as well do the radiator, its hoses, and the thermostat at the same time, which not only gets the engine cooling at nominal efficiency, but gives a lot more room to work on the water pump, kind of buried down in there. In my case, this water pump is actually only three years old, but I don't discredit it for failing because my cooling system is extremely contaminated with rust from a previous owner running plain hose water in this thing. I've already flushed it out once, but when the inside of the block starts rusting, there's really no coming back from it. So if anything, to anyone watching this, please do not ever run plain water in a cooling system, even if you live somewhere it never freezes. In this video, I'll be installing a port we can use to more easily flush the cooling system in the future, as well as a new radiator cap I said I'd replace a year ago. But you don't have to do either of those things in a normal water pump replacement. The only thing you'll need is a new gasket for it, and optionally, this metal pipe is commonly difficult to remove and is not included with a new water pump. So you can replace that too, or reuse the existing one. It is important to know that the earlier engines from 1987 to 96 used a different belt routing and tensioner, and the old Renix Jeeps have a closed-loop cooling system. So the overall process is going to vary a little bit on the older ones, but the water pump itself is the same part. For tools, nothing crazy whatsoever, just an 8mm, 15, half inch, 9 16 a whole bunch of extensions probably, a spill-proof funnel, I mean, just get one of these. I don't know how else you'd fill up the cooling system, honestly. Some pliers half inch wrench, screwdriver, three quarter inch wrench. Uh, I use a mallet and this screwdriver to knock the fan off, but um, I don't think you'll have to do that. A torque wrench, a scraper for the old gasket material. Speaking of gasket material, I have some of this gasket sealer. You don't technically need this, but since the four liter uses paper gaskets for the cooling passages, I've never been able to get them to seal unless I use this stuff, so. The 4 liter takes 3 gallons of 50-50 mix, universal, whatever, green coolant. Usually I buy a gallon of distilled water, a gallon of full coolant, and a gallon of 50-50. And then some paper towels, obviously we're replacing the water pump. And then in this video, I'm going to be flushing the system out. So I'm going to use a garden hose. And I'm also going to be installing one of these fittings on my heater hose so that it's not so difficult to flush out in the future. But you technically don't need to do that if you're just replacing the water pump. Important not to forget a bucket of some sort to properly dispose of your old coolant. And don't forget a gasket for the water pump if yours doesn't come with one. This one came with one, but if it doesn't, make sure to get a gasket. Step one is to make sure the engine is entirely cooled down. Let it sit overnight, and when you can safely remove the radiator cap, go ahead and do that. Both of the radiator fans gotta come out, so we have at least some working room. Unplug the coolant overflow hose and the electric fan before removing the two 8mm bolts on top. That's the first time I've broken that bolt, and I've had it out like eight times now. The E-fan can be hard to squeeze through here, and you might be able to open up some more room by removing the mechanical fan shroud on the other side with, again, two 8mm bolts. Before loosening the belt, we'll use its tension to our advantage. This is your opportunity to crack the pulley bolts free. Do not remove them yet, on both the water pump and the clutch fan. 
The fan nuts can only be accessed with a half inch wrench and be careful not to cut yourself sticking your arms in there because the blades are very sharp. And you actually don't have to remove the fan, it's just kind of in the way. I personally don't like having saw blades in my working area, so I spent some time getting it out of there. With those bolts just cracked loose, now we remove the belt. First, loosen this 15mm on the tensioner pulley. Again, do not remove this one. And then stick a long extension on that 15mm to loosen the belt manually. Sped up, you can see how this works. When it's loose enough, go ahead and get the belt out of there. Now we can remove the fan the rest of the way. They do typically get stuck on there, so I just smacked it with a hammer a few times, because what else doesn't that fix? You can take its pulley off and check the fan bearing for any unusual noise or resistance. If this bearing is bad, you'll have to find an AC compressor bracket to replace it. On the other side, let's get the power steering pump out of here. And again, you actually don't need to remove this, but I'll tell you, replacing the water pump is a pain in the ass with all this still attached. The power steering pump bolts to the belt tensioner, which bolts to the water pump, so leaving it in there means you'll just have something else in your way. The belt tensioner has a 9 16th bolt on the engine block reached with some unique maneuvering and then two more attaching it directly to the water pump. With the belt tensioner gone, I used a bungee cord to hold the power steering pump off to the side. We can finally drain the coolant, which there is a valve for on the passenger side of the radiator, but it drains so worthlessly slow, I just prefer to take off the lower radiator hose from the water pump itself, draining the engine block and radiator in about 12 seconds. I may not have been the best at naming colors in daycare, but that coolant certainly doesn't look green to me, which means it's absorbed all sorts of rust in the past year. Those particles are what destroy things like radiators and water pumps. Next, we gotta get the heater hose off the top of the water pump. To do that, I disconnected both hoses from the thermostat housing to get some room, and it definitely took some prying, but once that hose came off, we're almost ready to get the water pump out. Oh, come on. You should be able to remove the pulley bolts by hand, and with that off, you can access the four half inch bolts that hold the water pump to the engine. It's good practice to, as you remove them, put them where they go in the new water pump to make sure you don't get them mixed up. Usually engines will have a lot more than four bolts holding a water pump on, so in the Cherokee's case it's not essential. The only bolt that's different than the other ones is the one on the far driver's side, which shouldn't be hard to remember because it'll only fit properly in that one spot. But with the bolts out, just yank the water pump right off. Now I'm going to spend some time flushing out the cooling system in hopes of keeping it serviceable. I first shot water through the radiator cap and upper hose until water came out clean from the lower hose, and then because both heater hoses were disconnected, I moved them over the fender to avoid getting the entire engine bay drenched in water. Look at that, man. Okay, it's starting to clear up already, though. Okay, there we go. Alright, and after you get it clear going one way, let's go the other way. There, see? It's all dirty again. And it's pretty clear. And this is all you have to do to flush a heater core, really, is just keep going back and forth with it like this. I mean, the first time I did this, when it hadn't ever been flushed, it took me half an hour of doing this. 
before the water came out clear. Half an hour. This was only after a year of it being contaminated and it only took, what, you know, 30 seconds to a minute. I also need to flush out the engine block and the thermostat is going to be in the way. So I unplugged the temp sensor and removed the two bolts for the housing and then controversially shot water through the engine block again until it comes out clean. Now using hose water in the block isn't the best idea because that's what caused it to start rusting in the first place. But my cheap ass ain't spending hundreds of dollars on coolant or distilled water to flush it out. And besides, we're going to have this back together and filled with coolant in less than half an hour anyway, so I think it's better to have removed a ton of rust particles than not done anything. Well, I tell you, after only about 20,000 miles of running actual coolant in this thing, the inside of the block is starting to look a lot better than it was when I first got it. Cleverly, you can flush out the overflow tank too, but... Uh... Please don't use your mouth. <laughs> My bottle was actually pretty stained inside, so I ended up removing it anyway and rigorously flushing it out with the hose. <laughs> oh my god, I can't believe that worked. You want to make sure your water pumps are the same. You got the same bolt holes in the same places with the same pulley. The only difference you'll notice is this pipe, which we need to transfer over to the new one. Using a vise and a 3 4 wrench, remove the pipe from the old water pump. I wrapped it with Teflon tape because I have notoriously bad luck with things like this leaking if I don't, and then just tighten it down onto the new pump. We're going to tighten this hose down until it's pointed exactly perpendicular to the rest of the water pump. So, probably about right there. We can fine tune it on the engine. Back on the engine, it's time to scrape off the old gasket material on the block, which, although tedious, is very necessary. Spend some time here. Make sure to get that surface clean because you know it'll leak if you don't. Before getting the gasket ready, just quickly test fit the water pump to make sure the heater pipe is angled vaguely right. Now I'm going to coat the gasket surface on the water pump with sealer, because like I said, I've never gotten a paper gasket to seal a coolant passage without this stuff. Maybe skill issue, I don't know. But just make sure not to get any of it anywhere else, it's very sticky and hard to remove. With both sides of the gasket painted, I'll lower the water pump in place with a bolt ready to go in. And once you get it lined up, go ahead and tighten all four of them in an alternating pattern to only 20 foot-pounds, which honestly isn't that much. And I like to go to 25 just to be extra sure, but 17 to 20 is what the factory service manual says. Check the description for a discount link on one from eManual Online. Once it's tightened down, spin the pulley a time or two to ensure nothing seized or caught up. And before we get too far, you can now finally tune the angle of the inlet pipe. Now it's really just a matter of plugging things in and putting everything back where it's supposed to go. It's common practice to replace the hose clamps when doing stuff like this, but mine aren't all that old and I knew I'd be able to reuse them.
All the hoses are connected, so now put the belt tensioner back on, but don't tighten down the front two bolts all the way quite yet. Get the power steering pump in place and torque that down to 21 foot-pounds, and then go back and tighten the belt tensioner bolts, which I was unable to find a torque spec for. Go ahead and put the water pump pulley on as tight as you can reasonably get it, and then get the belt back in before the mechanical fan just so you don't have to fish it around those metal blades. Then put the fan on and tighten those nuts, and with the belt drive secured, go ahead and tighten the belt down. At the belt's longest stretch between the compressor and alternator, twist it, and when it can't twist more than a quarter turn, it's tight enough, and you can lock in the manual adjuster. When it's tight, you can snug up the nuts and bolts for the fan and water pump, which go to 20 foot-pounds again. Get the fan shroud back in, bolt it down, get the electric fan back in, attach the overflow hose and connector, and bolt it down. I used a zip tie for the one broken bolt, thanks stars. And with the fans back in, all that's left is to fill the system with coolant. Before I do that, I'm going to quickly splice in this port while everything's still empty. I just cut the heater hose, slid on the provided clamps, and plug the thing in and tighten it down. What this is going to allow me to do is hook up a hose here and be able to pump water through the whole system. It'll come out of the radiator cap, and that way I can flush it regularly without having to take everything apart. So that should be nice. Now, using a spill-proof funnel and its adequate XJ attachments, pour in a 50-50 mix of antifreeze and distilled water. When the funnel stays full, start the engine and let it idle until the thermostat opens up. While idling, check over the whole system for leaks. Yeah. Yeah. Got a little bit of a leak from the thermostat out of here. Upon further investigation, it seemed to be leaking from the upper radiator hose, so I just tightened this hose clamp a little bit more and let's see if it continues. see this new coolant is already turning brown. Like I said, it's hard to recover from a rusted engine block, but I think periodic flushes will keep this one going. Oh, there we go. <laughs> wow, that was quick. chilling around operating temperature. Just let it idle for a good few minutes. Try shaking it. See if you can persuade any more air bubbles out. And uh, do not under any circumstances open that when it's hot. When the coolant stops bubbling, put the stopper in the funnel and equip the normal radiator cap. I then put the extra coolant in the funnel right into the overflow tank. Okay, with my finally replaced radiator cap, you may notice the uh, overflow tank is pretty full because I dumped a whole bunch of extra coolant in there. That's fine because when I took that funnel off, we definitely got a little bit more air in the system. So now we go on a test drive. As you drive around for the coming days, periodically check that overflow tank and keep it at the fill line check for leaks, and watch the temperature gauge. There's really nothing more to it, so hopefully this video can get you back on the road. Check the description for a whole bunch of links to a whole bunch of stuff. And now, it's crunch time, because I got a whole lot to do to this thing and not much time to do it.